Hello everybody. So, February is behind us. A few bombshells were dropped, like the closure of the 3DS and Wii U eShops. A lot of games were announced and released. So let's go through everything that happened in the world of video games last month in one tidy package for your convenience. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the channel. This is From The Void. This news came out in the last day of February, so I figured I'll talk about it first. The Switch Online subscription now has included a missions and rewards section, this is brand new, where you can use your platinum points, those that we've been collecting for ages since the 3DS and Wii U, to spend those on characters, backgrounds and frames to create your personalized profile picture for your Switch. This is kinda cool, maybe, especially if they keep adding new stuff, and they're all cheap as far as platinum coins go, it's just five or 10 platinum points each so you can get one character and then add a background and frame to it. One problem though is that you can only mix and match characters, frames and backgrounds of the same game, which is kinda lame. The Mario Odyssey ones are going away in a few days, so get them fast if you want, while the Animal Crossing ones are staying for a bit longer. By the way, I don't play Animal Crossing, never have. That space in my life has been filled by Harvest Moon and now Story of Seasons, but some of these Animal Crossing characters are pretty cool, huh? Look at this strawberry horn rhino here. My god, how fantastic. So of course I made a profile icon of that, which is pretty cool, I gotta say. But ultimately I went with the Irish rabbit from Odyssey, for sure, no regrets. So in addition to the rewards, we have missions to complete that will grant us extra platinum points. There are four missions right now, and one of them rewards us with a different looking currency, this red mushroom stamp looking thing. But there is no reward that will require this currency yet, so they clearly have something new planned for this for sure, which is kind of exciting. So all right, that was a cool little feature. Moving on to the biggest news we got in February, that was for sure the announcement of the closure of the 3DS and Wii U eShops in late March 2023, which will prevent us from purchasing any games subsequently. Way earlier than that though, we will not be allowed to add funds through credit cards, and that's happening in May 23rd, 2022, and eShop cards for adding funds will also stop working on August 29th, 2022. So after that, you will apparently need to have a Nintendo Switch to add funds that can be used in your 3DS or Wii U, as well as have linked your Switch account with the 3DS slash Wii U accounts. That way you can add funds through the Switch as normal, there's an icon right in the top right corner for adding funds inside the eShop, and those will be usable on the 3DS and Wii U. I did some digging and talked to people in other regions, and apparently depending on your region, the same can be done through Nintendo's website, but for me, an option option like that does not appear in the site. My region is the Americas. I can buy games from there, but not add funds that can be used on 3DS and Wii U. So far I know that Germany and other European regions do have that option on the website, but I am unsure about everywhere else. So depending on your region, you may be forced to have a switch to be able to buy games on the 3DS and Wii U after August 29th. This is a mess. I mean, what the hell? I hope Nintendo saw this out before August 29th. I made two videos featuring 50 3DS exclusive games worth getting and there are several hidden gems there. I guarantee you will find a few cool ones you never heard of, so do check that out if you haven't, links in the description. Still on Nintendo news, the Switch surpassed 103 million units sold as of December 2021, placing it over the Wii and the original PlayStation, with no signs to stop. There are only 
four systems to surpass after that. The Game Boy plus Game Boy Color is next with 118.69 million units sold and then a huge jump to the DS family with 154 million and the PlayStation 2 with somewhere between 157, 158 million, somewhere around that. People are unsure for some reason, but it's for sure over 155 million. The PlayStation 4 is also ahead of the Switch with 116 million sold so far, but that one is still counting. So we're gonna see a race between the two soon, and that should be kind of fun. <laughs> Sony reveals that the major idea behind acquiring Bungie is to have the expertise to launch over 10 live service games by 2026, one of which is already in production behind closed doors at Bungie. Let me say that again, at least 10 live service games until 2026. We are in 2022. That's 2.25 games per year. I don't want them and I doubt they can make so many so fast, but let's see. Still on the Sony side, they are hinting or rather flat out stating that there will be more acquisitions this year. So fasten your seatbelts and place your bets on who is getting gobbled up by Sony next. I hope it's Konami, though I realize that they are bigger than they seem, so I doubt it. Now NFT news, because apparently there needs to be a whole section just for them every month because they are fucking persistent with this shit. Holy NFTs are such a baffling, hateful new thing that scum companies needed only a few months to create an even more hateful version of it. The NFT loot boxes. Yeah, Jesus Christ. That's a truly frightening new concept, man. Gambling for NFTs. Lord have mercy on us all. Atari was the scum company behind it this time. I mean, who is Atari now, really? No one, right? Just a logo. But they're now implementing the new monster NFT. NFT loot box behind the term GFT to once again disguise it as gifts. And look at this ridiculously convoluted roadmap of how they work. I mean, I should, in good journalism spirit, drill down on this to understand it and explain it to you, but I refuse. This is revolting and learning more about it would just ruin my day and nothing would be gained. So let's move on. Team 17 cancelled their pathetic Worms NFTs endeavors after both fans and their own devs under their publishing umbrella raged against it, as they should. So what happened here was pretty great actually. The backlash coming from the devs was particularly affirming. Among them were the overcooked devs Platonic and Agrocrab, who outright stated to be leaving the Team 17 and encouraged others to do the same and stated that this is coming from higher ups at the publisher who did not consult anyone about it, of course. The backlash was so heavy that they had to back down and cancel the whole thing. And just as Sega, EA and Troy Baker, the response was the usual tail between their legs, oh, we didn't know, but we heard the audience and now we are enlightened bullshit. Because of course they knew what they were doing all along. So that was that. And now, game announcements. GTA 6 was announced over a tweet, so naturally people are now demanding GTA 7. A Nintendo Direct was held in February and it was filled with great announcements, especially if you're into RPGs. The biggest one for sure, especially for me, was Chrono Cross The Radical Dreamers Edition. This is beyond exciting for several reasons. First, Radical Dreamers will be included in the package. It was a Japan-only alternative version of Chrono Cross. It's like a prototype of Chrono Cross that was not deemed canonical by the creators. Gameplay-wise, it's a text-based novel, choose-your-path kind of game. It includes battles also in text format. It's for sure something not for the mainstream audience, but it's great to finally have it officially in English for Western audiences. Second, and I think more importantly, this is most likely paving the way for something new in the future, especially if this ends up being a commercial success. And third, there will be a lot of added features in the Chrono Cross remaster, such as quality of life improvements, HD graphics, option to toggle old graphics on or off, and a reworked soundtrack by Yasunori Mitsuda. And by the way, this is the best soundtrack in all of video games, period. So if he can make it even better, it's gonna be the most amazing thing ever. And this is coming pretty soon, in April 4th, 2022, for Xbox One, 
PlayStation 4, Switch and Steam, and I can't wait. Square also announced the Live Alive remake. That was beyond surprising, and they're on fire with the old school RPG revival as of late, let me tell you. Live Alive is another Japan-only title and an excellent RPG with a completely unique offering where there are seven protagonists each in a different era of history. They're using the Octopath Traveler engine and style for this and it's looking gorgeous. Another must-buy for me 100%. And not content with all that, they also announced Front Missions 1 and 2 remakes. One is coming first under the name Front Mission First in summer 2022 for the Switch, and two is planned for later at an unknown date. The second one is even more exciting because we never got it in the West outside of fan translations. So that's really cool. Kudos to Square Enix for these initiatives. And a final one from Square Enix was Kingdom Hearts Integrum Masterpiece for Cloud. Just for Cloud, not for you. Still on RPGs, we got Xenoblade Chronicles 3 announced for September 2022, which is great, another one for the ever-growing list of games to play. And next is one that happened only in the Japanese Direct. Loop 8 was announced for Japan only so far, and it's looking really interesting, so I hope it gets localized. Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes is coming rather soon on June 24th. It's a Musou game that expands on the Three Houses narrative and lore, so I guess this is an established strategy for Nintendo now. If a game does well, call Koei Tecmo and have them make a Musou game expanding the story and their guaranteed return on investment. Alright. Mina the Hollower was announced by Yacht Club, creators of Shovel Knight. There is a Kickstarter for it. It raised over 1 million dollars. Wow. Disney Kart Racing Speedstorm was announced, cause this is what happens when you sit on Mario Kart 8 for 25 years, Nintendo. Pokemon Violet and Scarlet announced to be releasing in late 2022, very early for another mainline entry with a new generation, so I'm a little bit concerned. Atlas announced Soul Hackers 2 the sequel to Shin Megami Tensei Devil Summoner Soul Hackers that was only ever made available to the West as a remake on the 3DS. So this is exciting. Street Fighter 6 was announced and the game was overshadowed by the controversy around the logo they chose for it. First, people were just hating on it because it's ugly and then someone found out that they just used a stock image from one of those stock image sites and barely even changed anything. Just stuck a 6 in the corner and called it a day. So that's a great story for how being lazy results in a subpar product that customers hate. I saw some people saying that this is another case of Capcom plagiarizing they've had a few of those cases in the recent past but if this is a stock image and they bought it from the site which we can't know for sure so we must assume they did then that's not plagiarizing it's just lazy so there you go that's how someone in capcom being lazy became a bigger news than the announcement of freaking street fighter 6 even with broad ryu featuring in the trailer Clonoa Fantasy Reverie was announced to release on July 8th. It's not a new game, but rather a remade version of the original and Clonoa 2. Next is Nintendo Switch Sports. Um, people are furious that they removed Miis on this, apparently. This is a weird game to trigger the rage of fans, but anyway. I'm probably the only person alive who has never played any Wii Sports ever, so I am for sure the least qualified to talk about this in any capacity, so so let's move on. This one, however, I'm really hyped for. Mario Strikers Battle League. It's coming in June 10th and it's looking awesome and full of interesting features like equipping gear and power-up orbs appearing on the field. I love the other two games, so high hopes for this. And now for game releases. What should we start with here? Let's see. Oh, Elden Ring, of course. Elden Ring released to Masterpiece scores, who could have guessed? Horizon Zero Dawn released to excellent scores, who could have guessed? But the biggest news about Horizon is how Sony is duping customers into buying the $70 version instead of the $60 one, which is f***ed up. Monarch came out to 6s and 7s, I took a look at it and it seems really bland presentation and gameplay wise, so those scores seem fair for Monarch, unfortunately, because I was expecting more from it. 
Getsu Fuma then also came out to average scores, fives and sixes. This is from Konami. If they weren't so concerned about NFTs, maybe they could have helmed this one better because it had a lot of potential. Please, Konami, just get bought. Please. Dying Light 2 came out to mixed scores between 6s and 8.5s. Apparently everyone agrees that the story sucks though. Dynasty Warriors 9 Empires came out to 4s and 5s. Man, Dynasty Warriors is striking out one after another. I guess they are more focused on the Fire Emblem 3 Houses thing than anything else. King of Fighters 15 came out to great scores. I've been on a fighting game kick lately, so I'll be picking this one up for sure. Martha is Dead released to mixed scores. It apparently lacks focus, it's barely even a horror game after the initial hour, so it's frustrating despite having good ideas. However, it gained a lot more traction than the scores would justify because of the controversy caused by Sony demanding some content to be removed from the game, as they found some violent scenes too graphic. So naturally, that sparked a lot of curiosity to the game, which is selling way more than expected, because that's how things go. Now, on the indie side of things, because this is from the void, Rise of the Third Power came out and it's a fantastic retro-inspired turn-based RPG, which I reviewed by the way and gave it a great score, you can check that out in the description. Oli Oli World released two high scores, 8.5s and such, I really enjoy the look of this game, they changed it from the other entries in the series, and the gameplay too is great, I played some Oli Oli 2 in a friend's house and it was really cool, so I'll probably pick this one up as well. Infernax came out to great scores, including mine, you can check that out in the description, and this is a great old school style action adventure that draws heavy inspiration in both Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest and Zelda 2, but removing most, if not all, the problematic aspects that these games had to spare. Moving on to Sifu that came out to great scores like 9s. This one is really cool, it got a lot of mainstream attention, I'm really happy for them, and it's a very bold style of beat-em-up with really high difficulty, but also a great sense of accomplishment as the gameplay is incredibly tight. This is a must-play. And finally, River City Girls Zero released to good scores, 7s all around. This one goes back to the look of the old classic River City games, kinda, not exactly, but it's fine. I do prefer for the more fleshed out look River City Girls non-zero got, but I will also pick this one up because gameplay wise it's apparently great. And that's it for the February recap. I'll go back to making the Wii U eShop list now. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you soon.